Austin, I understand you recorded an intro for us. Shall we play it? Do a little dance, talk a little shakes, get drawn tonight, get drawn tonight. Do a little dance, talk a little shakes, get drawn tonight, get drawn uh, it, it was just an idea. It wasn't a good idea, but it was an idea. <laughs> Maybe that's a work in progress. Hello, everybody. I'm Austin Titchener from the Reduced Shakespeare Company. And I'm Gary Scribbler off of the social medias. <laughs> and we are drawing on Shakespeare again in our second episode. And this time we're talking about, oh, it's a classic, William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. So... A Midsummer Night's Dream. Every, well, well, I was going to say everybody's favourite, but I have a, I, I have a one friend in particular who hates it. He are you absolutely talking, hates. It. Are you talking about me? No. Do, do you? Are you a dream hater as well? I was. I have to confess, I was because I've seen so many, you know, bad middle school uh, productions of Midsummer Night's uh, Dream, and uh, but I have recently seen two fantastic productions in the last year and a half. One at Chicago Shakespeare, uh, here where I live in Chicago, and and then I saw the NT Live broadcast of the Bridge Dream production, uh, which was so beautiful and so joyous. You know, I think one of the things that, that one of the things that many people get wrong with Midsummer Night's Dream is that they they um, they don't make the lovers uh, or the fairies as funny as the mechanicals, and they don't make the mechanicals uh, as serious as they yep. need to be. I think that's absolutely right. I think that, that some people think, oh, fairies, they're going to be cute and fluffy. Mechanicals, they're funny. The lovers, they've got to be romantic or whatever, even though they've got some of the fantastic comedy in there absolutely and, and, and the um the mechanicals uh, th there are some beautiful uh moments of pathos with them if it's played that way well they really are and, and really the mechanicals are a bunch of uh, amdram community theater performers and there is nobody more intense and earnest than Amdram <laughs> community theater performers. How very right, how very true. Having spent many years in that environment I can 100% uh, agree. So the, uh, um, the, pl the plot of Midsummer Night's Dream is, is, is fairly simple. People break it down into the city versus the forest. Um, yeah, uh, and, and again, I suppose we ought to stick with our long-standing tradition based on our one podcast we've done so, oh, <laughs> our one uh, broadcast we've done so far of breaking down the plot, I guess. Well, yes. Um, another, another stern patriarch, Aegeus, uh, is threatening to kill his daughter by right of ancient custom or something um, yeah. if she doesn't marry the man he wants her to marry. She, of course, is in love with somebody else, and they run away to the forest to escape <laughs> and try to, uh, and they want to get married. But meanwhile, the boat, the the other man that she loves follows them, and the other woman who's in love with the man who's supposed to marry the daughter is follows them so there's four lovers in the woods meanwhile it's as simple as that really it's as simple as that but meanwhile there is domestic marital strife amongst titania and oberon the king and queen of the fairies in the woods she's got something he wants and he wants it back and she doesn't want to give it and so and so he commands puck to uh, uh, put place a spell on Titania and make her fall yeah. in love with the first person that she sees. That turns out to be an amateur community theater performer <laughs> named Bottom, who Nick Bottom, who is a weaver. And he, in the performance of Pyramus and Thisbe that they are rehearsing to perform for the Duke, he is turned into an ass, a donkey. And, and hilarity ensues. Hilarity and Seuss, merry mix-ups occur, the wrong people are drugged, people fall in love with the wrong people, people fall in yeah. love with the right people, and, <laughs> and, it, and at the end, everybody is um, uh, uh, open and more receptive to new ideas, new partners, and everything, every crazy thing that has happened has seemed as if to be a dream. I think that's very well put, well done. <laughs> I think you summed that up beautifully. Now, you, <laughs> as we've been uh, summing up the plot, you've been uh, drawing 
Yeah, I uh, I kicked off by doing a, a dreaming Shakespeare. Um, oh, sat at the bottom of a tree, um, dreaming about fuck. And now what I thought I would do is draw a couple of the uh, female, hum the human lovers, wow. Hermia and Helena. Helena. <laughs> now, which Hermia one is the... Which one is the tall one? That's Helena. Helena is the tall Helena. one. Which fascinates me because, I, you know, William Shakespeare wrote for a company of actors. He knew who he was writing for. So clearly yeah. he had a short young boy and a yeah. tall young boy to play the lovers. Who obviously, the tall young boy probably played Rosaline in As You Like It as well, because she has a line saying, because I am more than uncommonly tall, I shall disguise myself as a boy. Yeah. So you think to yourself, was that the same boy actor yes. that, that played Helena that must have played? Um... Well, and it's a point, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a dead horse I keep kicking, which is, which is that um, that Shakespeare, as good as genius as a playwright as he was, he couldn't have written such great characters without such great actors to perform Agreed. them. And I and and I and I know just from my own experience. And yes, I'm comparing myself to Shakespeare. That you Absolutely. write for the actors you know you're going to have, and you borrow everything they have, everything that is true to your actors, their height, their shape, how they, yeah. their affect, what they convey to an audience. Uh, uh, and it's fascinating. Shakespeare was a genius at borrowing all this. I mean, yeah, he was a company man, and he had these guys, and he said, oh, so-and-so needs this role. I'm going to do that. Oh, he's great at the physical comedy you know, whatever. And I think, you know, it, and then, then what happens now, of course, is, you know, 400 years later, we have to find people to, to fit those roles. Right. Accordingly, you know, well, which is great. And, is and the production uh, at Chicago Shakespeare did, was sort of ingenious with how they made Helen at all in the, in the section where they were doing, referring to her height, she was sitting on the shoulders of one of the men. <laughs> and, yeah. and that was sort of ingenious. Uh, now you're using a different uh, a, a platform to draw upon this week, uh, and I love the blue shadowing. What's the uh, what's the change? Okay. So this uh, last time I was drawing on um, layout paper with a brush pen, which is um, you know it was it was it's all nice and big and easy to see, but actually I I thought drawing wise it got a little bit tricky sometimes. So. This is a, a called a Cintiq. It's a it's a digital tablet on which I do a lot of my illustration work. Anyway, hello. And um, so I thought I would draw on that this week um, because we can then select the screen and do close-ups of what's going on on there. And if we cut some stuff out, I can time lapse it. So that would be good. Uh, so it's it's good. But you've got a choice of all these different um, brushes and pens and things. So I use the pale blue soft pencil to draw underneath. Mm. And then I use, um, I'm using a, a, a sort of fountain pen or dip pen brush with the black to sort of draw over the top. So the, the line on the top is the equivalent of what I was doing last time. And, uh, but it just gives me, and it gives me undo and I can work in layers and all this sort of thing. So. Well, and, 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 and one of the layers is, the, is that blue pencil layer. You could take it out if you wanted. Right. Yes, exactly. I mean, what I've just done now with this one, I've actually combined two layers down. But I'll do I'll do a drawing in a minute where I take that out and maybe put some shading in, so we we can see, you know, one of the other differences that it, it makes working like this. It's fabulous. Um, so I'll click them off, and I can start a new layer because uh, I think we should talk about Oberon and Titania, maybe. Absolutely. Let's, let's do that. Well, I guess yeah, because we covered a little bit of the humans, but I think Oberon and Titania. Um, interesting, isn't it? Because Shakespeare sets the play in Athens mm -hmm. and then proceeds to populate the woods with these <laughs> British folkloric fairies. Um, I mean, Robin Goodfellow Park is, a, is, is you know, a classic British fairy. Oberon and Titania, they're, they're, they're British fairies. And, and then, you know, the, the workmen, the, 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 the rude mechanicals are so obviously, <laughs> you know, Despite the you know the name Nick Bottom Peter Quince you know and yet they're in Athens. <laughs> it's well, so it's funny. and it's so much uh, it, it, it's so fun when directors try to you know um, uh, layer on a, a concept in a production, you know where oh we'll set it here um, we'll, uh, we'll set it here it'll mean this it'll mean that Shakespeare's already done that work he's yeah. he's 
He says it's, quote, in Athens, but it's England. <laughs> it's a hundred percent England. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, interesting. I've seen productions of Midsummer which lean into um, lean into the how just how hard and strong a, a, and dark really a patriarchy Athens oh, yeah. is as established yeah. by Shakespeare. Um, uh, the Bridge Dream does this partic particularly. Um, heavily and maybe a little on the nosily as they make yeah, it. Hippolyta in a glass cage at the beginning and all that sort of thing. Which was fascinating. And the other thing I thought that was fascinating about that Bridge Dream production is that the the Pyramus and Thisbe performance in Act 5 that the mechanicals do for the court and the lovers um, yeah. was funny, but it wasn't uh, hysterically funny or the funniest thing we've seen all night which I think is a tribute to the whole production because that means the whole production was funny and moving. Yes. And the end of act five in which uh, the love between Bottom and Oberon this time, not Titania. Yeah, made a little that was an interesting gender switch which actually worked incredibly well. Worked so incredibly well. That moment was so blooming joyous and funny i literally was weeping tears of joy and laughter in the theater yeah. when it happened i love uh, that headdress you've put uh, oberon in that's that's uh, awesome well as we're looking at you know i was thinking about it i said we were saying that they're kind of basically british fairies and gods and stuff like that and so it's it's the horned god it's it's the hern it's the it's the canonus the sort of the, the man of the woods, you know, and the, the antlers are very much part of, of that kind of persona for that kind of a character. And I, 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 I do love an antlered over. <laughs> <laughs> am, am I wrong in, in, in seeing a little bit of Tom Hiddleston's Loki there as well? I think, well, I think you possibly could see the element of that in there. Yeah, it's pos not intentionally, but um, I, I think subconsciously probably. But then again, you know, Loki is um, Nordic. Uh, folklore mm. again, which of course a lot of British folklore, you know, mixed from for all the invaders we had and everything. So the kind of Norse gods spill over a little bit into the British ones as well, you know. So you talked about the blue layer. Yeah, I I um I switched off the blue layer. Oh, lovely. It's hard to see from where you are, but yes. Yeah, so now I can. I've got another layer in here. I've put in. And now I can go in with a brush with some grey in it, say, mm. and uh, just dial it up a little bit so we can see what we're doing. And I can put some shading in like this. That's lovely. To give it, to give it a sort of, you know, some three-dimensionality. Well, and I, I love it as you're doing all this. I, 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 we've talked a little bit about how the, um, you don't, you tend not to draw scenery uh, uh, buildings and things. You like to draw living things. I, I like to draw living living things. Living, I mean, I, I can and have and sometimes do draw buildings and scenery and stuff because you, you kind of have to and it's the job, you know. Yeah. And um, in plays, I design my own sets and everything. So I would draw it for that. But, but by choice, I tend to draw, you know, organic things, people and animals and plants and well, that that's an in, and that's an interesting approach to staging the forest that I've seen. The the, the Globe Theater uh, did it in a, a production or two, I'm sure, and other theaters have done it, which is where a actors carrying branches create the wood, so that no matter where the lovers yeah. are on stage, actors holding yeah. branches are in front of them, so they're constantly foraging through um, um, branches mm -hmm. and brambles and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the, one of the great challenges, isn't it? To bring to bring the the the, the forest onto the stage, um, because you've also got to be in the town, and you've got to be in the, you know. You, there's lots of places you've got to be. So unless you've got the most spectacular facilities, yeah, you have to find these sort of um, you know wonderful solutions to that. And of course, that's why it's such a popular show to do open air. Yes, because you know if you're if you've got a place where you know you've got this beautiful woodland and stuff around you, you, you you've got it given i remember seeing a production at the royal shakespeare company years ago where it was a rubbish dump and the, and the trees were like metal spiral staircases and it was um that was one of my first sort of favorite ones 
And for a long time, I think that was my favourite dream that I'd seen live and still certainly in my top five. Um, I had these great sort of anarchic moments. Um, Richard McKay played Puck like a naughty schoolboy in a, in a school uniform, but they all had pointy ears and stuff as well. And there's that bit where he comes on and that thing about how language changes and how Shakespearean rhymes through the forest I have gone, but Athenian found I none, or whatever they would have said. And he was like, through the forest I have gone, but Athenian found I none. And he'd got the, 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 he'd got the uh, penguin Shakespeare in his hands. He sort of looks at it and just threw it across the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, brilliant. I, I do yeah. love a bit of playing with the text. So there's a little bit of a, a, of a demonic puck. It really puck. is demonic. I was struck by how demonic it is. And, uh, you sometimes they are, you know. Well, and you've cleared now. I see you've been influenced by Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, just a tad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, well, Robin Goodfellow. He's a, he's a sort of tr he's a woodland spirit, British folklore again. He's a, he's a trickster. He's a almost Loki like character in British folklore. You yeah. know, so. He can be a, tr a sort of trickster. I remember the BBC Shakespeare one years ago, and Helen Mirren was Titania, and, and Phil Daniels from Quadrophenia and mm. fame was this wonderfully kind of aggressive puck in that, which was kind of nice. I'm just going to do an alternative, a sort of different... I'm just playing with a couple of different sort of pucks here at the moment. Really. I love that idea. I love seeing uh, uh, different c characterizations of the characters. I love this. Um, at, we have, uh, with the Renew Shakespeare Company, my partner Reed Martin and I wrote William Shakespeare's long lost first play, Abridged, uh, yeah. which, which saw, um, basically, it was a lot of first draft Shakespeare. <laughs> it's our imagining of what he would have done at 17 when he had all, he was a genius and he had all these great ideas and he crammed all the characters and all the plot lines of his entire oeuvre into one massive, unproducible 100 hour script. And yeah. uh, only to realize far too late that, oh, hang on, <laughs> this is unproducible. I should divide this up into 37, 38, 39 plays. <laughs> but we took, we took um, uh, as our central characters, Puck from Midsummer and Ariel from The Tempest as yeah. um, and and put and created a sort of Beatrice and Benedict from Much Ado relationship between them, where there's a merry war betwixt them, like like Beatrice and Benedict, but also an ancient grudge between them, like the Montagues and the Capulets. So um, so so their magical rivalry created a sort of sorcerer's apprentice level of chaos which throws all the different characters from Shakespeare's plays into these new relationships much like being struck uh, stuck in the woods in midsummer where people fall in love with the with the wrong people and then decide sometimes that maybe they're the right people um, yeah. and it's and it's uh, so anyway the, the, uh, midsummer it, it, I think it's a popular play for for many reasons. I think it's it's the first, it's many many students, young students, first entry into Shakespeare. It's certainly a fantastic starter play for kids as well, because despite the crazy darkness of this guy saying, "I'm going to kill my daughter if she doesn't marry this guy," I mean, you can play that in it for laughs. Yes, yes you, you can. I mean, you can play it deadly seriously, or you can play it like you know, I demand the law, and and the other people say to be like, what? You know, um, so and then over on um, so Theseus can sort of go, yeah, well, you know, you better do as your dad says, sort of thing. And so you can play that part lighter for children, but it's it's great because you've got the fairies and the tricksters, and you've got silly bottom of the donkey, and it's such a good one for kids to sort of get their teeth into. And it hasn't got complex subplots, you've got this double storyline with the lovers and with the bottom, but they're very clear, and as you said, it splits into very sort of clearly definable sections and I think it's quite easy to follow. It is easy to follow and 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 the one production I love that the that the Globe did was that it it did a dumb show of how Theseus captured Hippolyta in battle which he talks about but mm. kind of hear that as exposition and it doesn't land this Globe production staged that battle and staged the capture of Hippolyta 
So you understand why Theseus is working so hard to make her happy because they're going to get yeah. married because he's going to marry this prisoner, but she's a prisoner. Yeah. But I did a, a production. I shall try and sketch this while we talk. I did a production with a youth group that I, um, that I work with of, of the dream. And, uh, you know, you have a, a certain sort of amount of cast in that, um, that you need to sort of find roles for. And obviously we had quite a lot of girls at everything. So it was like, okay, well, I need to create some roles without writing Shakespeare. You know, I mean, you know, I will admit on occasion in some cuts of shows I've done, I have maybe had to make the odd bridging line here and there to sort of make a cut work. But I think we've all done that um, over the years. But Listen, um, look at who I you're did... talking to. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, pot kettle. Um, so um, I uh, I decided I just I'd been watching Game of Thrones, and you have the Khaleesi character in Game of Thrones. And there's that wonderful sequence where she had the interpreter. Spoiler for anyone who hasn't watched it. She has this interpreter that she's with, and um, the guys are talking, and she's talking through the interpreter, and they're trying to sort of go around it. And it turns out, of course, she can speak the language perfectly. Yeah. Um, and I did that with Hippolyta. I had her with a trail of followers and an interpreter. So Theseus said, blah, 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 Hippolyta, we're going to get married. And she started speaking in a language that she invented, this actress. And then her interpreter started saying the lines for her. And then when he would speak, she would whisper in her ear and she'd react. And so he was getting, Theseus was being wrong footed. And then later on, she just suddenly starts speaking in English. And he's like, Whoa! and it was kind of a power play. I love really that. I love that. Well, and also you could, with all those girls, you can have a mighty arm, army of Amazons. And what that also does, it gives um, an urgency and, uh, and some stakes to the performance of Pyramus and Thisbe at the end, because it's not just that Bottom and Peter Quince and the Mechanicals want to do a good performance. It is that they must do a good performance performance they must make theseus and more importantly hippolyta happy yeah. on her wedding night and so theseus has a stake in the performance as well theseus wants it to be successful for hippolyta as well it just gives yeah. stakes and urgency to all your characters so they're not just sitting on stage going oh well this is a funny act five we can just relax now there you go that's a, yeah. a warrior queen hippolyta uh, which I love the idea when she's not just some some random person, but you see she's the queen of the Amazons. She's she's a warrior, yeah. And, and this is a, a part. From, this is a you know it's a political marriage as well as a, a, a you know it can be a love match or it can be or it can be not. I mean the other thing I love about that play within a play, the Pyramus and Thisbe scene, is that you know people over the years have said to us, you know, the reduced Shakespeare Company, how dare you, you know, make fun of of Shakespeare? Well. In Pyramus and Thisbe, Shakespeare is making fun of Shakespeare. He's yes. making fun. He's, he's satirizing his own sort of production of Romeo and Juliet, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so it's, we're just uh, following in his rather large footsteps. Well, and, and, the, and, and the other thing I love about, you know, Shakespeare satirizing himself is that he, with so much satire, you're also celebrating. He is celebrating the enthusiasm of of theater performers and yeah. the power of a the the power that a theater performance can have on an audience. He celebrates yes. that. That this is a celebration of that. You you could tell. I mean, you know, he was he was he he ran a theater company. He's got to like actors, and um, he he must have come across companies when he was you know a kid and traveling companies and then mu he must have fallen in love with it because you've got the whole s sequence in Hamlet when he's in you know, the advice to the actors and you've got the, um, the stuff in uh, Love's Labour's Lost with the show within the show at the end as well it, he did it more than once so I think he loved a bit of, of sort of you know um, he knew the power of theater for sure yeah at, at both so, in but in both real life and as metaphor yeah yeah, definitely. So, so I'm doing here, I'm doing a couple of different types of bottom that I've seen over the years. Because um, the great thing about bottom, okay, as a character, he is this, you know, usually a bombastic, but not always, but, you know, a, a sort of fun 
character who becomes a donkey, becomes an ass. And you've got to do that somehow in your stage play. And um, I've seen such sort of varied versions of it. So the first, the first one I'm cleaning up here is your kind of um, chunky, lump, lumpy sort of working guy with his hat and his vest, you know. Uh -huh. um, and you, you establish his look quite early on you know that he's like this and he wears his little hat or a, a, as i've seen it done a, a motorcycle sort of scooter helmet or something like that and uh, he's out there rehearsing in the woods with his play and um then he gets hauled off into the trees by puck and he gets the donkey head <laughs> put on conveniently off stage obviously shakespeare <laughs> in his stage craft which he gives you he gives you about a page of comedy with um flute having to do thisby for your actor to get changed which has got some great lines in it you know ninny's the whole ninny's tomb bit and you speak all your part at once cues and all you know <laughs> it's, it obviously <laughs> probably said that more than once to people in his own company okay so what i've done here is i've cleaned up um uh bottom in a kind of way that he sometimes played as a sort of you know yeah. slightly overweight guy or whatever with his little hat and then he goes off into the um the bushes and then quite a few times and it's a really nice simple solution version is he then comes out with the same hat but with the ears burst through the top of the hat nice so they just fade the hat and put some false donkey teeth in or whatever um yeah sort of yeah and that's a lovely sort of simple solution isn't it and i've seen that done quite a few times it really yeah. is in, and it works um, very well uh he gets uh bottom gets transformed in um, uh, our our script of william shakespeare's long lost first play abridged but because we argue that um uh er every animated disney film is based on a shakespeare play um he uh he comes out uh, as the donkey looking like Eeyore. And of course the other the other type of you know when bottom transforms is to go the full donkey with the with the massive head which I've seen done where someone has a you know when he's got a talk they've had a string and they've they've like pulled the string as they speak to make the mouth move or whatever. Um, and then sometimes I remember certain versions they even put like gloves on him that have hooves as well yeah um so you can have the the more much more bestial and i think it becomes a, a production decision doesn't it as to you know a what you can afford and b where you're going with that character i guess well and um, you want it to be funny not creepy <laughs> you know so yeah. you said the word bestial which of course makes me think bestiality and you know i have heard people object to Oh, you've made just made a woman fall in love with an animal, and it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and I guess yes, technically, but that's, I don't think that's, that was the intent. Was, was, the point was to make him uh, ugly and beast-like, wasn't it? And I guess the thing is, these days, quite often in productions, it's fairly explicit what's going on in the bower. I wonder back in the day maybe they just went off romantically and didn't but you know these days you tend to you often have writhing bottoms as it were and uh... <laughs> that's true they, <laughs> yes they can't just cut to waves crashing <laughs> <laughs> trains entering tunnels yes and, exactly uh, <laughs> the hitchcockian motifs yeah um <laughs> so there you go there's a lovely um, and I'll, I'll take the the uh the blue off of that one and just stick a little bit of gray in as well there we go have um, you ever wanted to do an animated version of a shakespeare an animated oh, film version of a shakespeare play so badly yeah um and i probably would do it so badly no yes i have <laughs> um it's i think it's one that would be crying out for it and and these days you look at some of the beautiful designs that are coming out of places like Pixar and Disney with the with the animation these days and the levels of skill that they are now. Yeah. It's it's surely it's a matter of time. It's such a great play. It's such a great story. Yeah. Guys, hello if you're doing it, give me a shout. 
Gary Scribbler. <laughs> um, I'll love to join in. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be fantastic because you could also play with the sizes then. There's no reason. <laughs> Go to Gary Scribbler. When well, you're playing with the sizes of the characters as well, you know, the, right. the fairies can be small. You know, they, they could be, you've got peas, blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed, you know, with tit Titania's fairies. She can be of a size, but there's no reason why she can't have lots of little Tinkerbell sized fairies in an animated version. It would be fantastic. And the transformation stuff with Bottom, you, you, oh, it would just be, I think it would be fantastic. It's, it's a kind of, I'm super, I mean, there have been a couple of animated shorts. There's the lovely animated tales that were done and there have been some nicely animated Shakespeare shorts. I, and, uh, you know, someone may correct us but i don't think there's been an animated feature now i want to see all these drawings fully realized that beyond sketches <laughs> is that just greedy of me <laughs> i'm going to move my camera for a bit so i can say hello properly hello people oh i'm drooping wait a minute it comes to us all there we go um whew, it's Bravo. quite warm Bravo. Uh, Bravo, Gary. You're doing all the work. I'm just sitting here drinking tea and being astonished. I have a, this is not alcohol. This is a, this is an elderflower cordial. Uh, it's not quite late enough here today on the recording to have a, have wine. So I shall have a quick sip of elderflower. Elderflower. Well, that seems uh, on theme for sure. Which is kind of appropriate. Yeah. yeah. I th now I fall in love with somebody inappropriate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Out in your shed. Well, in my shed yeah well it's been a delight as ever as always and i love that we're i love that we've been dealing with comedies so far and uh and i suspect we can will continue but uh, it, some of the other plays lend themselves to such cool visual ideas too like uh, yeah, we uh, austin and i shall talk be um, between us and we shall decide what the next one is going to be and we'll let you all know very soon thanks for watching thanks for watching everybody i hope you do continue to draw on shakespeare as we do absolutely um uh, give me your hands if we be friends and robin shall restore a man <laughs>